or Drago, Rocky, it just encapsulates yeah. both. It's like you need both environments. I think you need clinical, efficient training environments, but you also need places where you can mimic nature and 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 feel danger and have that challenge in other ways too. And you need both. That was Paul Cater, and you're listening to the Just Fly Performance Podcast. <laughs> If you're a coach looking for an awesome training portal to distribute and track workouts for athletes online or in person, then you can get a free 30-day trial of Team Builder software by heading to teambuilder.com and using the code JUSTFLY. See what Team Builder can do for you and sign up for that free trial today using the code JUSTFLY. Today's podcast is sponsored by the Plyomat. The Plyomat is not only an incredible vertical jump and reactive strength index uh, testing device, but it also is an incredible training device. The plyomat not only allows single response jumps, but also the chaining of multiple mats together. So you can use it for bounding multiple series of hurdle hops. And you can get not only height, but reactive strength for a multi-jump situation. It's an incredible, again, testing and training tool, and you can learn more at plyomat.net. Welcome to another episode of the podcast. Thanks for tuning in. I'm excited to welcome to the show my friend and mentor, Paul Cater. Paul is a strength coach with international experience, having worked in Spain and London, and then also in the United States in professional sports, having spent a great amount of years with the Baltimore Orioles and recently with the Los Angeles Angels. He's worked in the private sector with athletes of all ages and movement practices, and currently he is designing the Lab Monterey, a smart gym uh, in Central California. On the show today, Paul will be discussing how he drives engagement and leverages natural learning in the training session and how the role of mimicry, challenge, and rhythmic expression can drive not only better movement quality and flow states, but also lead to better performance outputs. If we discuss the art aspect of coaching, Paul's philosophy needs to be one that we're all familiar with. I'm excited to get this episode going, so let's get to it here. Episode 400 with Coach Paul Cater. Paul, you sent me this really cool, I mean, I'd seen this stuff before, you know, like the the Slavic dancing, like it's basically like the pistol squat dancing mm-hmm. that the like originated in Russia or whatnot. And I, it's funny because like you'll see the dance, you'll see the person doing the like the ex, the pistol squat exchanges, which mm-hmm. I feel like is just butchering mm-hmm. the movement in a horrible way. But like this video and I'll put it in the show notes, like there's so much more than that. They're like spinning around doing like side to side mm-hmm. stuff. It's all the music, internal and external rotation. And so, you know, and you had mentioned a little bit about how your process was influenced by things like that. I'm curious, and obviously dancing and training all in one thing. Um, tell me a little bit about what you think about that type of, um, I guess I could just call it movement, for lack of a better word. How does that uh, work into your training? What, what do you mean, dance? No, joking. I, I think um, culture, if you look at any culture, it's, it's the basis of that culture is ex- is expressed through dance okay i don't care what culture it is whether it's the maasai warrior tribe whether it's mm. the S- russian dancers whether it's flamenco dancers and to really understand a culture you have to really understand their dancing culture and their music integration and um i i i look at every athlete as not not genetically necessarily where, where they're from or their skin colors or ethnic backgrounds is, but you, you're looking at the whole, um, progression of where they've come from and how they move. And I believe right now in America, we're establishing a culture that's, um, devoid of some, of identity and basic movement patterns that are, are that come from everything from the music we listen to, to the, uh, the memorization processes that they're learning for sport things like that so um my goal yeah is to uh, integrate and you know make i'm looking at movement as a dance especially in the if you look at the first 15 minutes of any session how how you know how can we create athletes that are great movers who are rhythmically inclined great anticipators um you know can understand variables and move and handle load and all these things like this 
uh, in, in an effortless flow. So I think that's the end game of really any coach is to have their athletes be almost like dancers out in the field, you know? Yeah. Um, I actually, this kind of leads into another point that we had looked to touch on, but the role of like technology, it's so interesting with your gym or people have seen what you, you do. Oh, I do have to just quickly say, yeah, the Maasai warrior, uh, the jumping might've been another, I mean, cause everyone knows like the Russian dance, your arms across your chest mm-hmm. and you're doing the pistol thing, but, the, <laughs> but the, uh, the Maasai warrior, like when they're doing it, I think that what people also don't maybe maybe to a lot of people it's just something in the background they don't really notice, but they're they're doing like this kind of chant. It's it's not it doesn't exist. The, yeah. the side warrior jumping doesn't exist without the chant, the music, and the culture that goes behind that. And yeah, like you said, I think that we we just look at the jump. We don't look at like the dance and the culture that kind of goes into it. Or the the Russian like um I, yeah. I feel bad. I don't know the name, that cultural name of the dance that they do, but it's the same thing. There's, there's music behind it and there's a cultural overlay behind it. And yeah, we, yeah, we just don't there's a, there, that. Usually there's a, usually there's a, a deeper reason why. I mean, if you look at capoeira yeah. in the Brazilian culture, you look at these expressions of dance, they're often with fighting. So the, like the Russian dance, there's the soldiers that were doing that. And then you look at these warrior class that are integrated with dancing. And it's funny because I, you know, I, I, when I lived in London, I'd go to the ballet every year. And now I try to keep that tradition and my little daughter's in ballet. But um, the whole idea that, you know, you even look at the Nutcracker. So that, that was the first uh, example of my life kind of like, oh, wow, this is like, it's a fight, you know, dancing is really ingrained in battle and i think sport in general too you're 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 mimicking other people's movements um you're mirroring movements you look at defenders look at the look at the defensive back and a a, uh, Mm -hmm. wide receiver so if you're in in, in and i put now i have two little daughters you know i've coached a lot of uh, female athletes in development but when you get into the male dominant realm it you it's really hard to you know a minor league baseball system if you talk in these terms of of mimicry of mirroring of rhythm uh you you looked at as you're crazy if you're crazy but if we go back to origins of, of dance of rhythm in a corporate setting it is it is tribal it is a battle we I mean, look at some like you know look at uh pacific islander culture you know you, you're you're looking at a uh, warrior class doing coordinated rhythmic dance before battle. You know, I've seen it professionally on first hand. You know, I had never seen rugby before. Next thing I know, I'm watching, you, you know, New Zealand do this, yeah. um, the haka before. So things like that. So that's how I look. I guess if you want to enter into this podcast or this conversation with my training methods, and people ask me, what's your philosophy? I think that's. Mm-hmm that's a big deal about it is how do we in, incorporate rhythm into force production mm, yeah and into corporate or and into intuitive and handing different variables as you see in battle in or in a fight so those that's the contents we look at in training and i think that's where we you and i really groove and have talked a lot about yeah but it's always hard to put into words and it's hard, especially in a strength conditioning culture where Everything's Excel sheets and, you, you know, sh- strict, rigid cultural norms. Yeah, But it takes us to get out of those. Anyway, yeah, sorry. Just cut me off anytime. I know I ramble. Uh, no, I, yeah, I, I have a bad habit of, I think, just mm-hmm. having a thought and be like, oh, I got to say this <laughs> before I like forget it or something. Not like I'm yeah, going to, yeah, but this yeah. popped in my head a little bit ago was, I, I think, kind of maybe maybe like you were saying like we ultimately what does everyone want well what are the sets what are the reps what are the exercises but before all that there's a culture and even things like just sport like basketball right oh it's like a you walk into a gym and i just think about just walking into open gyms when i was a teenager and what do you hear you hear the beat of all these basketballs bouncing around there's something yeah, that's shoes yeah exactly and i again i think we we think about that only with okay what's the what's the plays or you know what's the setups what are the drills mm. but there is something that is that that is cultural beyond that and i think there's sounds to it and i 
I kind of mm-hmm. feel like too, I'm, I, you, if you have a gym, you have a training space, what do people think of when they enter that space? What do they feel when they enter that space? What are they expecting? Um, I think that those are, those are things to think about with what the total training package is. 100%. It's, uh, I took a class. It, 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 so at UC Davis, a little of my history, I played football there. I was a rhetoric and communication major before they cut off rhetoric. And this mm-hmm. was a commu- communication and, uh, and a history major, first and foremost. It was later that I got my master's and now currently working on my PhD in, in exercise science. But I, um, so I learned, lear- you know, I learned through like a, a pre law visual. And one of the classes I took was called, you know, the rhetoric of architecture. So you're looking at every building that built has a, has a, has a message that the architect is trying to, to, to design. And yeah, so I've, I've, this, I'm on my fifth gym. Um, I'm building out this, this gym to be kind of the, uh, hopefully the final project, <laughs> but, um, yeah, there's, there's a rhetorical message with everything. And it, you know, every strength coach knows, you know, you, certain things go here, you know, the NSCA, you got to have certain safety, you know, walkways and you can't have mirrors low enough. So you, the weights hit, you know, stuff like that, logistical safety issues. But when you're talking about what's the first sense that you get when you walk in the, in the door. And how do you create that on a daily basis? How do you usher in a, an athlete into the, what I believe is the five minute adaptation point within a session? I mean, that, that, that has everything to do with the sight, the, sm- the smell, you know, the, 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 the beat, the rhythm. How do you, how do you gather whoever's in the building into a place of, of adaptation that we're looking for? So yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. It's, and it's almost in in some ways, and I know I think we talked about this on the last podcast in terms of how the training unfolds. There's you do have like a meat and potatoes at the end of training sessions, like like all right, here's the weightlifting, and they're I think they're usually sets and reps assigned, but that's that's only a small chunk, and the whole lead up uh, to that is a little bit more organic. And I know something I was going to ask you was well, okay, well how tell me exactly you know it's like asking a musician tell me about your creative process right but i think mm-hmm. you just mentioned it that a lot of it starts with things that just aren't often thought about with like you know the environment like what what does the athlete feel when they walk in the door what does the environment say to them and how does that environment um help you to start to understand to feel what direction to take the training with more of that like rhythmic piece before they get to the I guess the, the tip more typical meat and potatoes and sets and reps. Yeah. So I think, you know, I, like you said, m- music is huge. I, I, I did, uh, my first postgraduate, uh, it was called a graduate diploma. Well, I was doing my master's and then I, uh, got a graduate diploma <laughs> Excuse me, at, at Brunel university. Anyway, some of the first research with music, um, was done there in, in, within, distance running and how that, you know, how music affected running performance. And that was really interesting. Yeah. That was on the lead up to the London Olympics and they were doing some great stuff with cycling as well. Um, but so that, that, that's a, that's a big thing. I think you want to, you want to engage, you want to engage quickly, but, uh, a big part of with, with all my athlete populations is I want to, um, in, I want to have them enter into a challenge phase. And I, 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 I base a lot of my training philosophies on two neuro, um, you know, cognitive processes, which one is the transactional model of stress and coping and working, having athletes, uh, especially younger athletes, ex- re- be readily, more readily able to accept challenges as rather than seeing things as threats and, um, or being actually just not aroused at all. So, offering enough like the right amount of noise the right uh, environment when you come in to be challenged not threatened and see their see like a, as a growth and gain a master and mastery you know for an outcome where you really engage people and this goes for whether it's a navy seal or, or a 12 year old or a pro athlete you know are they going to be challenged and can they can they grow from that challenge but also um I quickly go then from then into more of the the mimicry, and and uh, s- some of the, some of the processes that happen with with l- learning and the motor motor skills that are observed in bird song, and re- really a, a lot of 
a lot of the speech and and fine motor skills are in a certain you know the basal ganglia the corti- cortico basal ganglia complex that is where where you know birds are observed to mimic songs where kids are are learning learning language and that there's a, an associated rhythmic motor uh, motor sensory uh, component so i want to be able to a challenge uh but also ha- and have a, cha- a s- appropriate stress there but also start to engage the deeper uh motor motor skill patterning that's more like uh not not as an overt thing but more um involuntary contraction so to speak so those two things are very important when someone walks in the door and that carries through the whole session. And of course that depends on the groups and whatever, but, mm-hmm. um, and really that, you know, the funny, cause music can do that. And the opening salvo of exercises can do that on both levels. Yeah. Okay. And maybe that is, it's, a, you know, you're engaging an athlete. Again, I have people from six to 60 coming in. And one day I could be working with all these different people, but you may be doing the same session with all of them. You might change the music for every one of them. Um, yeah. But, or, or, or the simple, the, the simple buy-in uh, warm-up exercises. So I guess in summary, yeah, it's the first 15 minutes whereby you're challenging them, you're in, initiating rhythm process, and then you're dosing the right amount of force for that within those rhythms to build into the main like a series or b series you know the main strength outcome you want and that's the process every day you know or orchestrated yeah um i had a couple thoughts to follow up with that one thing actually this this popped in my head and this goes a little bit my mind was jumping a little bit back to what you said with the maasai and was the thing with the russian dance but it was um there was a video it was like break dancers versus gymnasts and I know gymnasts do, yeah. you know, musical routines as well, but the majority of gymnast mm-hmm. work is a little bit more, maybe it's more rudimentary, you could say. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't have a massive amount of experience. I mean, I've, I've messed around with breakdancing type stuff and done some of the moves, especially in high school. And it was actually really, I think it was actually a helpful part of my physical development back then. Not that I ever got to like a high mastery level. I could never mm-hmm. do flares or anything like the, there's all these moves I wanted to do, but couldn't quite get but mm-hmm. i in that video at least our video i saw and i'll put in the show notes like i mean break dances anyone who's seen break dancing i mean these these individuals can they've reached a pretty high level of athleticism mm-hmm. in what they do and uh, it's it's funny because it's uh, it's just cultural it's musical it's community yeah. based yeah. <laughs> and you would think how good could they have gotten if it was just practicing moves, you know, in your basement or something with no music and, you know, you didn't have all this cultural, this culture to bring mm-hmm. you to whatever level. And I'm sure there's probably a story of someone who learned all the moves in their basement, but there's still like the music and there's still like so mm-hmm. much that goes with that. And I think there's something that's really unique to that. And so, but I, that kind of had got me sidetracked a little bit. I was thinking about that just for the power of, of culture and music uh, into a physical quality and a physical ability. I guess that's maybe a little bit more where I was headed with that. But I think a lot of times with some of these things, and I know this is true for me, I'd be curious what your thought is on this, but mm. I find I, in motor learning, like there's, they talk about attractors and fluctuators and mm. I feel like the further you mm. get into some of the language there, sometimes it can feel like you're really far away from training. <laughs> uh, but an yeah. attractor for me, is it's almost like those pieces like you go to to start the creative process like maybe it is like the speed ladder maybe it's mm-hmm. hey i i got these like a lot of times for me it's hey i got these plyo boxes and I, and we're, maybe we'll hurdle them maybe we'll chase over them maybe we'll do bounding over them yeah um yeah what are some like key pieces that you generally like to start with mm-hmm. that can get you all right hey this is working let's go to this next piece here uh tell me a little yeah. bit about some of those those attractors that Oh, yeah, the spearhead, the opening salvo. Right. Tell me about the opening salvo. I yeah, like the, the opening salvo, the, the opening, the haka. So <laughs> you're, 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 there's got, there has to be a challenge. And I go back to the challenge element. There has to be a, 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 I go to these two things, challenge and mimicry. Okay. And even in a bird, and I'll go back to the bird example, is that the birds are often mimicking. They hear a sound and they mimic it and then they vary it. They're communicating, right? I mean, it's usually like a, bre- a mating thing, or maybe it's a, it's you know, there's some sort of interaction, there's some sort of transaction happening. 
And if you if you look at the first opening salvo, or even like, okay, let's look at, use the haka. I know it's kind of completely different, but there's a transaction between the English rugby team and the, the New Zealand, mm-hmm. the, the Kiwi rugby team. There's there's a, so if you look at what's the transaction that's happening in the footwork ladder, so to speak, or whatever the the, the con whatever the the vehicle is to deliver this. It could be footwork ladders. It could be whatever. It could be a game or something like that. But I look at the the challenge and then the mimicry. And if you can initiate a student or an athlete of any age, mimicry response, the motor learning happens a lot quicker versus memorize a drill, memorize a warm-up, Check that off the list, <clears throat> and 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 so I, the way I do that is by if you can literally start to match your beat downbeat timings with a music selection I put in within the ladder, you're getting those two things. It, because if you do it in a peer group, you're there's a visual of you trying to do that, and and of course I'll do it in a safe way where it's, it doesn't make the student feel super vulnerable. Unless it's somebody I really want to break down, who's mega confident and can handle that. But so you 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 add elements of okay, let's do on the downbeat of this song. I want you, first. I want you to match the rhythm of the footwork ladder drill, and I want you to go into that single leg, like you know, whatever knee, deep knee bend on the downbeat of the song, and it it really. It, it accomplishes so many things for me so quickly. And that's how I view the warm up, And that's how I view ladders and things like that. It's like you're, or let's say a basketball player using BOSU, whatever it may be. It's like, can you mirror somebody? Can you match rhythms? Yeah. And then obviously your body heat's going to r- rise, but it's completely opposite to a memorized rollout and active dynamic. I, I've completely ditched active dynamic warm ups. You know, I maybe do them one percent of out of a hundred sessions one time. Yeah, the but that's that's it's just it's inefficient to me. It burns so much time when I don't have time with athletes anymore, and that's really the model. And if we can talk on a bigger context of you know why this matters, like what's what you know why does this matter, is because strength coaches will have less and less time with athletes outside of a hyper managed like just managing. I don't even know what to call it, but there's less and less coaching that's going to happen for a strength coach. So when you do have it, it has to be very effective and and you have to condense time very quickly. So I don't know if that answers your question per se, but it's, that's how I, if, if I could take one example, it would be choosing a song, mimicking beats and rhythms within a mechanical uh, drill with peers. Yeah. Um, you had so, mimicry when you started what you, you had said mimicry and there was one other theme. I, 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 I had something to say uh, about mimicry, but I was trying to remember the other, um, challenge. Oh, challenge. So, yeah, that's right. So, and that, and that really approaches the two different, uh, psycho psychology and, and I don't know, I guess neuromuscular adaptation. Um, you know, neuroscience, let's call, mm-hmm. call it, you know, that everyone's listening to Huberman and all these guys. <laughs> it's, uh, even Goggins is becoming a neuroscientist yeah. <laughs> learning, you know, so you know, but I respect that because it's, you know, it's, it's great. It's opening doors for, to understand this stuff. But I, I, I look at those, you know, I was reflecting on my philosophies and I was like, okay, so what is it? And it's like, those two things really channel my first 15 minutes of every of every session and then the rest i I hate to say it is going to be automated by ai and and the technology i mean that's the future in in my opinion you know 10 years ago i took pride in oh i could teach power clean great you know all this sort of thing but now it's like what's the future of strength coaching and i think through the course of this conversation in the back of my mind is really what is the role of a strength coach going forward. Yeah. That's uh, the challenge makes so much sense as well. Cause yeah, mimicry and challenge. It's like, you know, it's almost like you could call it being an, I mean, it's probably not great to put labels on things, but for people's understanding, it's almost like you're an athleticism dance 
<laughs> it's a, it's a well, dance of at, athleticism. At you go to a dance class. Back to breakdancing. You know, and I was going to say, I, I took a breakdancing class in, in college, actually, an elective, where like, you know, you don't get credit. But I mean, I, you know, I went every week, twice a week or something like that. I learned, I learned all the, the four pillars of hip hop mm-hmm. and the, you know, all the, all the things. But it's, there's a challenge element. And that's what breakdancing is, right? It was like one guy would go, the next guy would go. <laughs> Excuse me. And then, so it was interesting, especially because you're, you're matching music, but you're, you're getting, it was the first time I understood like getting down versus like all these outputs going up. And yeah. that's, that's kind of been, and I hate to, it's in a weird way. That's like set the course of my training, like mm. life, the last 25 years, like 23 years, whatever I graduated 2000. Um, but learning how to decel, like, eccentric rates force production has been like i would consider my forte okay and that's what weirdly led me into like flywheel training because like you're, you're dealing with high rates of eccentric force development and you're learning it in a rhythmic capacity so you're learning how to handle force in rhythm and there's this weird kind of like break dancing battle about it where one guy goes the next guy goes. i don't know it's 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 dance to me it really is and and that's now what i see is the missing link in all these athletes is they become more and more robotic there's more and more data there's more and the co- coaches aren't art artists or teaching movement anymore they it's that's kind of outsourced and they, and really what people are going to be interviewing for are just being weight room managers and all you got to do is yell a bit or, you know, the good, the guys who are really motivating will become, you know, football guys and the rest, you know, so, um, yeah, I, I, I see this as a conversation around that, that, you know, so w- what do I have to offer to anybody listening to this stuff? Yeah. I think that'll naturally yeah. lead us into like the data and how can AI or technology what role does that play you had an awesome post with that i want to save that i actually have it like in the corner of my note sheet because i think this will lead into that really well Uh, i do want to touch on the mimicry as well though and even Mm -hmm. like it will even break dancing it's a battle right one guy goes and then there's a response like it's like we're wired for that if we just look at yeah hip-hop like or even like rap battles right it's like there's Mm -hmm. this wiring for like that 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 interplay and like basketball and downbeats and so um, I did actually want to get into the, yeah, because we were having a conversation about the upbeats and downbeats. I do want to get uh, into that, mm-hmm. but just like the mimicry stuff, I, all this to me and, and my whole, so much of my, um, athletic and co- coaching career has been trying to figure out those things. And I've mentioned this in this podcast before, but those things that when you play a pickup game of basketball and you can jump so high at the end of that, and then you go and do like, you know, some traditional 15 minute warm up, and here's the dynamic stretches and here's this and here's that. And you, you can't get within two or three inches of what you could after you play that basketball game. So what yeah. is it about that basketball game, you know? And, and, and there is that, like that mimicry and that, just the social and the cultural, like I mentioned, like even like, yeah, I hear those balls bouncing on the ground and I hear the noise and the, everything that goes with the game. And there's the competition, obviously. And, but but in basketball too, and this kind of leads me. Well, I'll just say this quickly: is that with the mimicry, you know, everyone's like, "All right, well, what's the bottom line? What's the output?" I just had a high jump practice the other day, and the first day we introduced just some mimicry games as part of the warm up. Just like you know, we don't have a basketball there, but let's warm up with games that invoke that. I had a girl set a lifetime best in practice, and like it does, right. it does get your system going to a higher level because ultimately that's what we want, right? But we also want to have fun along the way, like the sayings, like it's there's, about the journey, not necessarily you do the journey right, and the results will take care of themselves. I, I, I attribute that to um, there's inhibitors when there's over, like there's there's analytic processes, and some are more prone to it than others, like the whole paralysis by analysis. That's why for me, I played college football as a as a linebacker, kind of safety weak side guy. Um, but I was always better on offense. Okay. A, I learned the game on offense. Um, but for whatever reason, my brain was wired. Like I didn't have in retrospect, I just didn't have a inhibition <laughs> to go just fly and make tackles and anticipate things. I was trying to learn a system 
like I, maybe you know it's no no coach's fault. I I I was there was a bit deeper fear in me of making mistakes and trying to memorize things and or memorize plays instead of just playing. Partly I, I attribute that just because I learned football through an offensive scheme scheme. But I I think when in a general sense, if we teach athletes or young athletes to to memorize drills or plays, we we take out that creative inhibition that we, we talk about it with running too. You're trying to memorize running strides and patterns. And it's like it's it's either not your identity and your genetic profile. Like I'm five nine. If when I when I stopped trying to run, uh, like I was six five, at like uh, 400, 800 meter runner, like I I stopped injuring myself and I got got back to accelerating even like at age forty. It was like a lot of I attribute to you and Adari Bar is like relearning my like natural pathways of like movement. I was like, oh okay, this makes a lot more sense. <laughs> but I think that's that's what I'm trying to say is like we if we create these creative creative license to move and to compete and to mimic instead of just trying to scale these drills and warm up, especially in warm up. And so many coaches write the warm up off. That's like when they're having their coffee or like, you know, getting, getting, setting up the weight racks. That's like almost the, that's the most important time that we can embed and code these rhythmic competitive movement patterning things. So yeah. Yeah, there's the, the pickup games, the pickup games, you know, like that's just, that's where kids learn and perform, you know? Today's podcast is brought to you by Lost Empire Herbs. You can save 15% off of my favorite products with Lost Empire Herbs by heading to lostempireherbs.com slash just fly. Use the code Joel15. Lost Empire Herbs is a go-to of mine for supplementation. And looking at the principles, the patterns in nature is such a, a profound, a powerful um, observing, a starting point for me in my training. And I've taken that over into supplementation or my choice of supplementation as Lost Empire Herbs has harnessed the power of nature, getting things with such minimal processing and such a rich history in Chinese medicine uh, for helping you to improve your vitality, energy, uh, and even strength through their products, uh, things such as Chili Dip, the Phoenix Formula, and so much more. Head to lostempireherbs.com slash justfly today and check out some of my favorite herbs and there you can get, again, 15% off your order. Yeah, it's almost like in some sense, there's almost like that, hey, I'll be a pickup game facilitator of, of sorts. Pick up mini games, mini pickup games throughout the session. Uh, that's my new I, job title. That's going <laughs> to mini pickup come, game well, facilitator. <laughs> What? Yeah, I've. We can talk about this later when we talk about the tech stuff. But I, I, yeah, I. That's really the role. Of that's really a, a big part of the role of, of a coach. Okay, that's really a big part is to get the heck out of the way. And a lot of the a lot of your guests on your show, you talked about that. Is talked about okay, doing less. You know, getting out of the way so these. These kids and, and and as a whole, youth development is it goes the other way. And I and I'm I've been on both sides now, trying to monetize a gym, trying to scale, trying to but I've also been on the professional sports side where you don't have to do any marketing or scaling in, in that you have your athletes. And I tell you, once you start to try to make money and try to get more bodies in, you need to format things and you need to and it, it immediately dumbs down uh the process for 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 youth. Especially when you when parents or their coaches are you're trying to please them, and man, it it is a quick downward spiral into robot robotic children who ultimately get could get injured. They can't get it in and out of positions of problems, and also a lot of our colleagues and people we know and respect are going through that like nonconformity cycle in their in their careers, where they're basically saying screw the system. I'm a nonconformist. They've gone through their professional jobs or college jobs. Now they're on their own and they're getting this cr- massive like rush of creative license, you know, and it's indicative. A lot of, a lot of coaches are, are like, yeah, <laughs> like part of the gym. Okay. Part of the traditional strength coaches gym is to inspire a little fear. 
that there is a like when you're coming in this isn't just romper room yeah that and that's the fine line you want to give structure you want to challenge but you also want to create a, a ton of freedom to create to discover movement to to do all these things and that's the real the nuance of i think running yeah. any facility or weight room yeah how do you how do you re establish control and authority and challenge but also have natural mimicry and movement yeah. and re- looseness in, in in it all and there's not a fear-based culture that and that's essentially the issue is like if you're creating fear-based systems that are highly rigid that are highly scalable uh that maybe uh, gms want or that ownership wants you're gonna have less you know you're gonna have more let the outcomes aren't gonna be as great and you're gonna have more injuries yeah it's interesting it's interesting to think of in the sense of i guess you could say that i i I just had an email talking about like you know futsal in the like the favelas of brazil Mm -hmm. like these all Mm -hmm. these like games organically that mm-hmm. can cultivate elite competitors and elite ability and then well how do you and daniel coyle then like the little book of talent talking about if your facilities are too nice it almost mm-hmm. like gives you that mm-hmm. internal sense like oh you've made it you're good you know versus like i guess rocky yes. right the rocky archetype that sits in all of us and so it's i think well. the the thought is and and you know it, you could say strength and conditioning in a professional setting or whatnot you know maybe there's mm-hmm. a different role that Versus, hey, this is, we're bringing up, you know, youth development, movement, or even, you know, high school or mm-hmm. university or whatever. Um, you had mentioned, too, working with a variety of age ranges. Yeah. Um, so, I, you know, I'm, I'd i imagine, like, what, it is interesting to think of what people want in the pro, you know, the pro space versus, hey, I, I'm a high school athlete. I, I, I really want to be as good as I can be. Um, you know, yeah. what do you got for me, Paul? Like, and, and so I, I suppose there's things to consider there, but that's just the trick, isn't it? And I know for you, I think you've mentioned this, that some of the best sessions that you've ever had are like out of the garage gym, right? Like yep. two or no, three people, yep. you know, stuff like that. So a cu- couple things come up, uh, in mind. Uh, a, I'm in a, probably the nicest golf training facility in the world. And I, I don't, I'm not exact, <laughs> I'm not exaggerating that. Um, people are going to come from all over the world to train golf here. So the challenge is with the young golf teams, the, uh, in that culture, um, who, you know, you know, for me, I'm not, I'm, I'm not part of the golf culture growing up. I respect it. I know the golf rules and stuff like that. And I, I can be around a country club, but I, I think part of the thing I bring to this, this culture at the lab in Monterey is where, uh, you, you, you know, a little you have to have a little bit of that grit, that edge, and that, you know, kids can have some a little more structure than they're used to as, as opposed to doing anything they want and having every resource. I think when you have, if you have resources abundant, never having the challenge, uh, then you're, you're not going to have, you know, you, you have to almost manufacture it. Yeah. And that might be a, a socioeconomic thing. But yeah, I, 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 I spent very early times in Barcelona playing soccer in the street with kids and i'm thinking wow you know these guys are able to play uh, you know play against each other in the church courtyard in tiny spaces and then no wonder why the american soccer uh, industrial complex or whatever you want to <laughs> complex is you know abundant fields abundant resources they're never going to hold a candle to the to the to the cultures that are playing in the in the tiny street corners you know and who, who are, you know, stuff like that. So th- those are two examples. I think, um, yeah, and the garage gym. I think, he, 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 you know, I, I assume, you know, I also think of like the college weight room. Super nice. I mean, the best facilities, they're just ama- amazing. But half the machines don't get you, you know, all these resources are just, these guys are not spoiled, but whatever. Uh, but so you have to manufacture it with strength coaches and intensity and wearing chain, like doing all this crazy stuff to bake in the uh the grit factor um or whatever or or get a navy seal team to come have you run with a log in the beach or something like that yeah (laughs) but yeah for for myself yeah the garage gym i think that's so important for any strength coach uh you know i don't know about athletes per se but to have a a sanctum a, a place to get back to the basics of 
the, the, the barbell or the grit factor or whatever. I mean, I, my, my garage gym is pretty highly technical. But yeah, yeah. As far as your garage gyms go, <laughs> yeah, yours, yours is uh, you have some nice tools there, but it's still like has an two. authentic feel. Yeah, two. The, the 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 mountain garage gym is logs and a bar, and I wanted it to be as cold and as rough as as heck. Because when I come <laughs> back down to the my current location in Monterey, I have every tool available. So it's like okay, the contrast is super important for me to to not to lose track. But yeah, those 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 are some things that come to mind. But yeah, the favelas. Kids playing soccer in the streets, lifting in cold garages in the in the mountains. I mean, we need these elements, you know. Or maybe the the Alab, you know, the football team, the the elite power five football team needs the strength coach that's gonna do some like crazy things to enable uh or in spark that grit factor. Yeah. You know, I don't know. You, you so, know, it could be said, like I I'd be curious, like the robustness or the quality, you could say the quality of a country's sport development system or, or the type of athletes that come out of it mm-hmm. could be linked to how the children play. You know, like you said, like, because it's different, mm-hmm. like what, like a, a first world country, the kids have it all. What does their play look like compared to a country that maybe like soccer, let's say soccer is a huge part of the culture, but they have nothing, you know, like what, what does the play you, look at the like? Ver- yeah. At the very least, you need to understand it. So you need to understand where that culture, that person, that kid, whatever the team is coming from. And that will really dictate in the nuance of, in the rhetoric and the music of what you need to spark those two things, the challenge and the mimicry. And that changes by hour. Yeah. I mean, I have kids bust in from one of the best private schools in the nation who or, or they're rolling in in their, in their G wagons when they're 16. And it's like, okay, this might be different than the kids deeper in Salinas who, I mean, I have a kid who just got signed to Cal who took the bus an hour to come train with me and pay. And his parents paid the top dollar versus the team that's comped getting driving in on their, on, in, in, in their Mercedes on their own, you know, when they're 16, who's coming, who living in Dubai or whatever coming from. So it's, you got to really, I think that's a huge part of it. Every athlete and their subpopulation has a collective experience that you, that are coming into the training environment. And, and we just at least have to know it and, and be kind of culturally aware, I suppose. That's where the whole diversity, that's what it means to me, you know, is, is just being, is just being aware. And that comes when you travel, that comes when you learn these different things. And it, it, I, I was asked in an interview recently, uh, and this is a whole other topic, but what are, what's one of the most, what's the proudest things you've ever done in your career? And I said, I, it's kind of a tough question, but I said, I was, a, I was, a, I've been able to assimilate or, or not be a chameleon, but serve a different culture and sport culture and international culture wherever I've been. So whether that was in, in rugby in England, whether that's professional baseball, those, all the cultures within that, the Latin communities included, whether that's the Navy SEALs. Being able to morph into those and serve those different places. Anyway, so that's that's one thing that the NSCA, I don't know if they teach, you know, I'll be honest, in yeah. their certifications. It's very important. Yeah. Yeah. It just goes back to how we opened up the conversation, just to the culture behind mm-hmm. things and just, and just spending more time looking there. I think it's, it's so important. Um, mm-hmm. I did. So a couple of things I wanted to get into. One, I guess the mimicry yeah. piece. Because I, I do think it is interesting. I, we look at a lot of coaching as, mm. all right, here's the workout card or, you know, or here's the, mm. here's the training yeah. drills. Here's the you know, today and, and go, you know, versus, mm-hmm. I, you know, on, at what, uh, you know, in terms of your mentorship of coaches or your thought process. And, and I guess for me, like the mimicry, I know you n- dance naturally comes to you. I'm sure there's a lot of coaches <laughs> who'd be like, I'm not dance training my group and leading. Cause if people watch you training yeah. athletes, they see you like it's a ladder and they see you going through the yeah. ladder because you're feeling you know, what the next thing is and everyone follows you. And I've been through that process with you and I've really enjoyed it. And it's fun. And then you'll have people like mm. facing each other on the ladder and doing mimicry based drills, mm. building out what you just did and then going off into a sprint and it all builds in layers. Mm. And so for me, like, I mean, my mimicry, like even in track, like I fundamentally enjoy like all right hey we're going to do this high jump and let's do this series of skips and then go jump this series of bounds then go jump and here's what the rhythm should look like and it 
Mm-hmm. When I demonstrate it first and then have athletes do it, it helps me feel connected mm-hmm. to the practice. And right. so, but then, then again, you could also be a mimicry facilitator. Hey, here, we're going to do these small sided games and you're facilitating mimicry. Mm-hmm. So do you have any thoughts on like for just different uh, interns you've worked with, uh, what you've yeah. tried to communicate to them on what they should be capable of doing? Any thoughts well, well, on that? Well, yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, for, first and foremost is I, the purposely withholding directive speech, I think is a huge, is a huge, um, part of the, the teaching um the, you know teaching people whether it's a coach or an athlete so what I, what I try to do with my with my coaches you know I, at this point 10 years into a, well, 11 years into a private business and having a lot of interns who are now i mean at least in baseball i have three or four or five working at, at pretty high positions in um in in professional baseball but in, in different different areas you know my developing coaches is learning to coach without saying anything so that's a that's demonstrating things but also getting an athlete to understand and anticipate what what the point is faster than just doing the drill itself because often i let them interpret things and even they'll ch- they'll change this drill through their interpretation but as long as the principles there I, I let them go with that because that's the last thing I want to do is have them come into a into a fear situation where I have to memorize something else today, and uh, so that's a that's a big one. Coaching without saying anything, mm. and it's frustrating a lot of times for people. Especially, you'll have a lot of um, interns who the reason they want to do an internship is because they're very you know uh, they're taking they're being assertive. And they want to learn things and they want to have a formula to, to, to learn. And that's why they're learning from you. But, you know, you, it's like kind of the Yoda, like withholding information on purpose for Luke. And Luke's super frustrated. Then he goes, gets his hand cut off. But there's a point of like a learning, a learning pace that you want to withhold and how to do that with, and how to know how to do that with each, with each individual and their learning styles is really, is imperative. Cause then, You'll never teach another coach how to do that if you just hand them the format, you know. And um, yeah, so that's one. That's the biggest thing for me is, is learn how to learn. Show by your body doing things or leading them to understand the point without even. Sometimes I'll, I'll won't say anything and I won't do any like do anything. I'll just create the environment around them for them to really understand it. And probably that's looking at somebody who's been there before. And then they'll mimic that athlete who knows the drill and what I want. But it accelerates the learning motor skill and, and the cognitive piece so, so much faster. Yeah. And, but it's frustrating. And then often you lose some people because they just want it now or they want a formula and say, sorry, this isn't the environment for you. So, I mean, I don't say that per se, it just kind of happens naturally. So I want people to be a little bit frustrated. Uh, it just beats the rope. Yeah. It kind of d d anyway. Yeah, go on. Yeah, no, I I that the way you just said there too. That little bit frustrated. That is so key because I think uh, what is often thought of as good coaching. I just have in my head. There was this one video going around. It's like this is how you coach up a squat. And this was like I don't know mm-hmm. a year ago. And this guy, <laughs> this coach, told this athlete like two minutes of squat cues. And I'm like, man, they talk about like you know, yeah. I guess like an empty cup versus a full cup like that. That athlete's cup of instruction had been overflowed about 20 times <laughs> versus right. like, like going back to what you said, like, let's just say how free play and you're mm-hmm. learning, playing your game, soccer, basketball, whatever, kind of in the street. And you're just mimicking the older kids, the older kid that you're trying to mimic or the star yeah. on TV didn't go tell you, <laughs> they didn't give right. verbal instructions with that. And so it's like mm-hmm. your cup is more full with just that natural mimicry and that that's not something I think we talk about a lot from instructing and the role of the, the coach there. It's yeah. not, I'm even thinking of myself, like, you know, I'm like, hey, we're going to do this skip into the curve and jump. I yeah. just, just, <laughs> the coach just went and did it. I guess I got to do it too. Yeah. You know, there's a different so feel with that happening. Right. So what, what you're teaching kids is to, to be highly aware of other, of, of the cultural surroundings, the, all the, all the, the external factors to go into the in, in appraising the situation to be able to a 
accept the challenge and the growth opportunity versus it's a threat. And then shift into mimicry mode from either an older kid who's done it or often a younger kid who's done it in the same building or an adult. But my my job in, in is to create an environment that that's that happens very quickly. And, and and then it goes it goes back into the context. Okay, what is the role of a strength coach? Is it to deliver, is it to manage a weight room? Is it to to deliver a program? Is it to coach? It's becoming less and less to coach movement, I hate to say, especially when like Olympic lifting's not as you know, prevalent, and I wouldn't say prevalent, but you know, uh, when, when, when the machines and the AI and the tech is going to be delivering all these things or, or the, you know, or you're going to get all this mm-hmm. feedback with ki- coaches or ki- kids can automate these things. So our jobs are really to create how fast can kids do these two things, challenge and mimic. Yeah. You know, accept, accept challenge, appraise, and then mimic. Yeah. Those are and with the that... cool part, and the the outcomes are going to be that's where the injury prevention comes. Let's not get stronger or have greater, you know, for, rates of you know concentric force, which is typically what we measure, or it's not even going to be the rates of eccentric hmm. loading. It's going to be how quick can we adapt, accept, and change. You know, and then it's like the whole conversation of te- elite tennis players. And that, that's where the hours and hours and hours, the hours come of practicing that, not necessarily the skill itself. And then you can anticipate changes like, you know, the old tennis player returning a serve. They're not really thinking about that. Or, or you know, it, injury prevention becomes anticip- involuntary anticipating of, of changes of force. I look at the Achilles, look at the Super Bowl Achilles example. It is abstract, but it's a metaphor. I'm not, I'm not trying to say what caused the Achilles rupture with the linebacker, forgot his name, the Niners. But to me, he was going on the field. The get back coach said, stay. And he had like this application of force that wasn't anticipated. And like the, there was a timing that wasn't practiced. So, we, we, you know, I, that's a different subject, but kind of like to me is a metaphor for like we break when we're, when we do, things that aren't anticipated you know? so we're training the ability to, to handle variables and not be tense at the wrong times but psychologically as well so we're creating robust athletes mentally and physically but a lot of times that doesn't play and that's why i pre- pretty much had to do my own gym because that doesn't play in a, in most professional settings it doesn't play when you interview they say what's your philosophy you talk about that they want to say i want i can scale to I can scale the thing for kingdom come because really we, we have cheap labor sources and we're just going to process bodies. And I think that's probably in the military as well. Definitely in baseball. Yeah. That's, that's a deeper, yeah, sorry. That's a different can of worms. But. Yeah. Yeah. The, the mimicry and challenge, again, just back to like, I guess to me, it goes just back to that pickup basketball game to get ready to dunk. Mm. Like the things that make us mm. human, you know, it's the things that, that there's, and you know, to separate out, well, what, what can technology and data, or even also, you know, the, the part of the strength program that is like, all right, hey, here's your four sets of five, you know, like that, that mm-hmm. part that's more, it's like, you just know this part is there. And then the human part is solving, is going through that problem, that problem that's, yeah. that's there, you know. That, uh, can I, can I, I mean, yeah, I can ahead. segue to the tech piece, but... Uh, I did have one other uh, part. Actually, let's get to the tech piece. Um, before we get there, can mm-hmm. we talk about upbeats and downbeats? Uh, you yeah, mentioned yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And, and <laughs> like, because I, I, I had sent you a, um, a little YouTube link. It was like, mm-hmm. how does syncopation work? And I'm like, it's like, mm-hmm. Paul's been on this for years. <laughs> you know, I'm just like learning yeah. it today. I'm like, whoa, this is really cool. <laughs> but yeah, tell me a little bit about what more what you think about the upbeats and downbeats and what it means. Even like basketball, I will just say quickly too, my, the part I liked is like, the basketball, it's like you're doing some moves, then downbeat, try to go past the defender, mm. you know, like, and it just feels natural. But training, it's just like downbeat, 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 <laughs> or whatever. Uh, tell me a little bit more about your, um, yeah, syncopation, music, and how that upbeats and downbeats fit into how your, the flow of movement and physical training works for you. Right. So we're, we're talking, you know, I, 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 it's kind of funny because 
when I, I, I attribute a lot of this to living in Europe like 20 years ago and never heard, I've never even heard house music before. And it was just really interesting type of music for me. And I would go to these like dance clubs and we were coming from, you know, you had nineties rap and things like that. Uh, but never hear, having heard house music and looking at like, I started looking at rhythm and associating, you know, then I've never even seen soccer before. And then going to like, you know, Barcelona, the soccer games, this mass, there's kind of all these cultural and musical things hit me and learn and understanding like there's a, a corporate vibe that happens <laughs> in with a DJ and it goes for hours and people just lose I mean, it may be the drugs, but it's, I was doing it without drugs. I'm like, man, I, I've been like dancing, for like, like in this rhythmic beats, but forever. I was like, great. I mean, whether it was four in the morning or not, I, I was just like really fascinated by the, the music. Um, but uh, when I started to, to feel like my body felt different dancing in that regard and like learning how to handle force and like where they were accentuating the, the, the beats. And what we're talking about the other day was where, where these DJs were putting like little, little variances on, uh, on the rhythm and the beats themselves. And <laughs> a lot of it was on the down, on the downbeat part that I'd never really thought about. Cause I think American cult context, we're always thinking about power outputs and like the, up, the upbeats. And I'm, and I'm not a music major or anything like that, but I just felt like there was a different nuance in with house music itself. And that's where I would start to lace my warm up music. And, you know, if you're doing deadlifts that day, then you turn to heavy metal or something like that. But it's, it's my warm ups were always on focusing on accepting the force in a down, in the down phase and then being able to redistribute. And then you can add little variations of rotation or whatever. Yeah. On it. That's, that's to me, it's kind of a weird like origin. Um, where I was like, oh, this is like different music and there's different, um, you know, going back to dance in a corporate setting. And then you go to Ibiza and these other places. And this is kind of before all these, honestly, it was strictly Euro vibes, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so like that, that affected me in a different way. And then I, I laced flywheel stuff on top of that, which the flywheel masters were coming out of Spain and, um, you know, Sweden but the, the real practitioners who put it into play with these big soccer teams were, were the Spanish. And um, I flew down when I was living in London and started working with some who are now my mentors and my PhD, but they, uh, they were really understanding how to, and it wasn't a barbell culture. So they're like, how do we get, you know, messy to <laughs> do weight training? It may be not, do, he's probably not gonna do power cleans. Uh, so learning from those guys and then like, oh, this really kind of matches, a, 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 you know, back to the whole original point, like a cultural corporate dance situation. And that's, that's where it really sparked my, my interest. So the, that, through that mo medium of music, I, I was able to kind of see all these downbeats and then whether it's the Russian dancing or anything, it's kind of like, oh, I start to decode these things and, and how do you train? So it's like, okay, one of my major philosophies is, and, and even that we align on it, I think is like, whether it's squatty running or whatever, it's like optimizing elastic, you know, energy through accepting the ground in different ways. And yeah, and that creates resiliency that cre creates efficient movement, running economy, so to speak, movement economy. And ultimately, looking at energy systems in, in, via this whole route of downbeat, down, you know, accepting force. So that's a long explanation, but I think house music is part of that. Europe is a part of that. That makes perfect sense to me. With you, it's almost like um, like but your roots as a, a, a coach. And the tools in your toolkit. And I remember one of the first um, workouts that I did with you, we just went through a bunch of, you could say, basic sprint drills, but you had taken them 
to like if you found a certain groove with the music, you would do that drill with the music. And now I realize that a lot of times that drill had a downbeat to it. And one drill, not a sprint drill per se. Actually, it's funny because I have these in my program now, uh, online program. I call them cater twists. <laughs> I don't know if you like that or not. They call them cater twists because if people have seen you do this, it's like you're doing a ski, like you're skiing, like side to side. You'll do like three skis side to side <laughs> with the knees together. And then on the fourth one, the downbeat, you go down into a squat. And then you go back up mm-hmm. to like the easy ones at the top. Or it's agility, yeah. you know, just, hey, move your feet side to side. One, two, three downbeat squat down and there's just something that's inherently athletic it yep. feels good to do that i think it's good to do things that feel good that feel athletic and I remember- well, there's, uh, there's natural I'll, I'll cut you off real quickly and add to that there's but there's natural cycles that are within those i don't think they're they think they just naturally come out yeah that are and then if you mirror if you match that to musical theory like the fourth count and things like that or like even like a tempos with swinging it all relates so there's musical theory within swing patterns within footwork patterns with stored energy in general and how eccentric concentric phases are you know you know arranged yeah sorry i know that's all good i I was even thinking too about how and you had said something about the four beat a long time ago mm-hmm. that, that that's and, and I, in this one video I was watching I was saying like a funk in a funk rhythm mm-hmm. like the first beat of the four is like the one that's really accentuated and I was thinking about like I don't think it's a mistake and I guess this is just one of many patterns mm-hmm. you could do but like in a Russian lunge traditionally you do three little bounces and then one big jump or oscillatory mm-hmm. training I think one of the main ways people do it is three oscillations and then one big movement and there's other ways you can do it, but it's like, that's what just kind of feels good. I even, there was one day, I, mm. I'm certainly, this was inspired by you, but like I was doing, like I had some of my headphones in, I was doing a warm up mm. for sprinting. I was going, uh, doing some work on my hill and I was just doing single leg bounces. Mm. And then on every, however many beats I would do, drop into a skater squat, you know, like, and then bounce back up again. And, and that was well before the video. And I think a lot of that was, again, your, your influence on me, but I well, think, look at track. Yeah. Look at track. Look, look, look at a high jumper. You're a high jumper. Is there, I mean, obviously this, these things are laid out or a triple jumper. There's like an approach of storing of energy and a natural expression point. Okay. And I don't, you know, maybe, maybe I'm overreaching my lane here or something, but you can teach that. I'm sure there's like very scientific. You got to put your foot here. Here's your foot placements. But I bet if you just teach a random guy, there's like a, there's an approach. Bing, bing, bing. And then there's like a natural time where you're just like, I have to express this in, the, in a vertical play, plane or, or, or whatever. So there's like, or like you see a guy like stutter stepping, getting ready for the big jump to dunk or something like that. I think we can figure the, the point is, I think we can figure these things out. Yeah. But are we giving kids the freedom to do that? Or do we hammer in right away? Like these are these steps you have to do to do a proper jump, you know? If, yeah. we, if we can just give, I think, kids enough. I, I, I think strength is important to be able to do these things. I, often we coaches, I see skill coaches trying to teach things and the kids can't even do them. Yeah. You know, sprint starts is a great one. It's like, let's have this really dramatic, long extension point out of the blocks. But they don't have the strength to even do that to then do this foot, pl- these, these foot placement sorts. And then I, I, I was working with a college sprinter this uh winner came in uh, a local track coach recommended because he knows i can train them and not you know and collaborate well which is which was beautiful but uh he didn't have he was trying he didn't have like a strength base to even do kind of what the coach is wanting him to do like this guy's he had a scholarship in sprinting it's, it's crazy so we have to really coach to not only culture but also where their strength yeah, like strengths, and that 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 might change the whole step order or how much we integrate. Let them be creative mm-hmm. in general. So I, I digress. I sorry. No, that's that's a that's a good point. And hey, that so I think that could lead into the last question. You had an mm-hmm. awesome post. I'll put this in the mm-hmm. show notes of the episode. <laughs> but the the Rocky Rocky needs Drago in the sense of, mm-hmm. and I think this is a good one to kind of close out. In you know, mm-hmm. we talked a lot about the creativity and the mimicry, the like the very human side of things, but then, you know, the rise of AI and 
you know, it's not inconceivable, right, that in just even a few years, as the computing power doubles or the AI doubles rapidly, like, you could just say, hey, I want this program. Boom, it's going to spit it out for you. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's a camera that watches you and gives you feedback. And <laughs> what's, your, mm -hmm. what's your take on what would the ideal world be and how do we do use technology? Mm -hmm. Because I know you have a lot of technology and always really have in your process. Uh, and I think people wouldn't outright think that. Oh, it's just this, here's this creative coach who uses all this dancing. And, but no, you yeah. have all, the, like, all these tech pieces and data feedback pieces. Yeah. Tell me how you use those. Well, my mission has always been to have enough tech knowledge, well, enough technical uh, feedback points and even uh, ways to induce these these necessary forces and whatnot to, to gain this beautiful, like, elastic harmonizing, whether, you know, it's vibration, flywheel, motorized, mechanized, mm -hmm. magnetized. All <laughs> so it's, <laughs> The it's list like, gets longer. Enough, yeah, have all these tools so I can just be me and be a coach. I can see things, make some assessments, but do it in, a, in an or, in organic context that's highly relational. Mm. Um, so right now I have a gym and I, pretty much I can run it within a 5,000 to 10,000 square foot um, space where the technology the programming parameters do enough of the work in the strength development. I mean, obviously people need to have, okay. Like if you're, if you're, if you're having a velocity based training system, that's AI driven, that's pre-programmed. I mean, a kid has to be able to, or an athlete has to have some basic movement principle to squat. Okay. Mm -hmm. If that's the exercise of the day. But other than that, you know, um, my goal is always to have a, a smart gym where I can, get back to coaching and not be a weight room monitor or um, just a raw, raw guy, but really, really to, to, to create the creative rhetoric of challenge and, and bring out the mimicry process. And that, that's my, that's been my goal. So right now I'm, I'm getting closer to having that smart gym um, where I can get, I can every machine, every, every station or exercises, putting data, you're collecting the data, it's making sense of the data, it's giving the AI piece to adjust and the prescription of the exercise. And all I really have to do is say, okay, well, this, you know, what's, what's the theme of the day? And the kids can create within that. Well, not the, I don't say kids, I mean, shoot, grown men. People can create within that and I can be a facilitator and a guide almost just like a DJ. And I, I envision my, myself like almost like that. Like you're creating, the, the, setting the table for people to ex have be automated within that. And the tech just collects and guides a little bit. Hmm. Yeah. I, I think uh, I want to go to something just quickly you said in that mm. Instagram post I thought was so good. Mm. Isn't that like, because it fits with this, with like mm. how much tech, mm. how much data is that that the whole like biohacking like data led health approach the you said the margins for improvement there are so low compared to like the natural mode which is basically just training playing mimicking culture mm. in nature like our natural state um if you want to expand on that at all because i yeah. think that was really really yeah yeah well na nature provides that naturally right so i was just like doing like broad jumps up up snow and like i was having to like adjust for the the surface. So the snow and I, the skiing is huge. Like every, the snow conditions changed by the hour and you're having to adjust to ice, the powder, to whatever temperature adjustment in, in, or, you know, training, you're training outside. You're hearing things, you're seeing things, there's different services there's different temperatures. There's different light. And like, I think it's, it's so important. There's austerity in, in austerity with one barbell in a, in with a in a garage with just logs everywhere and whatever like all the other senses come alive right so that it, that's in contrast to a gym that I'm running and developing right now where there's all these the senses are like in different different ways like there's so much feedback that's being done for you and in I think each cuz if you're only in the super high tech environment 
where everything's autom- automated and <clears throat> you're getting a lot of feedbacks and from, you know, all the data, all that sort of thing, you miss out on the nature. And, and if you're only doing the na- natural element, then you're missing out on the other feedback. So I'm not explaining that well, but I think one needs the other. And you have to assess kids now are only going to be in this tech world. You know, we're at, we, we came from your backyard jumping, trying to touch a b- tree branch, right? And you have to almost understand where kids are culturally coming from in that, in that context. How much have they trained by themselves out in nature? Mm. You know, running up hills on your own, automated, by yourself, your own personal willpower and motivation doing, right? That's going to become less and less. Trying to touch tree branches off of, you know, Mm. the tree branch, Joel Smith tree branch touch jump protocol. (laughs) uh, My my training memories are coming running up this one street outside my house. You know, I didn't need anybody to do that. And, and, or, you know, I was blessed to go to division two UC Davis where we didn't have a strength coach. He was like the running back coach. He was also like top PE or whatever. It was weird. You know, we had some Xerox copy of, the Rams 1984, like strength program. That, it's like, nice. We had to run. That's what I knew. Like, okay, being a strength conditioning coach is my thing. Is we we kind of like automated ourselves to train. We found these different paths, but kids are going to have less and less of that. Yeah. Um, so we need to integrate the natural pieces and whether it's the training camps. And that, that's where it was great. In London, we go to, we go to Poland, some training camp out in the forests of Poland where you showed a video. These guys doing all this, like, I think it was the, I don't know if it was the jumpers or yeah, weightlifters. Lift, weightlifters, no. yeah. Yeah, so I, I lifted in that weightlifting hall where those guys trained. Nice. At an old Soviet, Soviet installation. We would fly there as a team to use our cryotherapy chamber, which was like you could fit six guys in. It was, it was insane. And uh, yeah, so that, that, like, you would go in the forest. That's the role of these training camps. In Europe, you really understand that. Like, they go to these forest installations. I took the rugby team to some mountain top in Spain where that we got snowed in. And, but you just have all these different natural natural elements. You need that. You need you need that to invoke a psychological challenge to have mimicry of nature as well. Feeling touching different surfaces, being scared. You know, I'll go run at dusk. And by my house, there's mountain lines, and I'm like, okay. I bring a knife for my dog, but you know, I want to like, if I'm like, there's my mountain lions and coyotes, like I, I'm going to run different. There's a different response at dusk to that challenge and, 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 and whatnot. So I, it's hugely essential. And, and I'm going to start doing training camps probably up in, uh, oh, up yeah. in Tahoe on the quarterly or at my, at my facility, there's, there's a beach right across the street. So with the super tech world I'm in, I essentially, and you have to ground yourself with these different natural elements. And I think, unfortunately, it's becoming so like a holistic grounding, you know, unfortunately, the recovery uh, phenomenon of ice baths and saunas and all these things, they're so good, but they're, they're taking the place of just the natural experience so much so that it's becoming just like footwork ladders, like things that were well-intended now are becoming so formulaic. That they're losing the you're losing the cognitive and <clears throat> motor learning and all the like all the adaptations physically, you know. And in the last uh, Huberman Goggins podcast, talking about the, the the part of the brain that is the willpower part, you know, yeah. Like they're basically saying like, okay, if you're not if 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 doing an ice bath isn't a big deal to you, then you're not going to get the benefit of of doing something that's stressful or like that you don't want to do you're not going to grow the willpower part of your brain because it's like it's just so normal so if ice baths are so normal like jumping in the ocean is no big deal so he said i want to keep some of these things sacred yeah no, I, I hear you man i mean that i remember back before i got into ice baths mm-hmm. i my reference point is, point is almost swimming in the ocean with you after a workout you know where's yeah. like there's like waves and like you're moving around you know the original right yeah. or the finding a cold, or finding like a cold a stream thing. you know find a cold stream in nature uh, and there's a little journey to it you know that that story well behind it, right? yeah i mean i could tell like the experiment we did with minor league baseball team when i was in salt lake city 
we'd go to the coldest stream and it was sub 40 degrees most of the season. And we'd have pitchers, a group of us organically would go. And then we, you, you know, your core temperature would take so long to get up and like who performed well at practice or the game and their bullpens are in the games. And it was really, it was evident guys were yeah. doing great, like having performance knock on effects, but it was not just the cold. It was the whole adventure yeah. the heroes quest situation and getting them out of uh, their comfort zone. So uh, I, a Drago Rocky just encapsulates yeah. both. It's like, you need both environments. I think you need, clinical efficient training environments but you also need places where you can mimic nature and 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 feel danger and have that challenge in other ways too and you need both you need both so that's why when i go i my best training is not in this environment because i'm in this environment all the time so you have to gauge the, your cultural context where you're at most and provide stimulus outside of that yeah I think that's a great place to leave off on. Um, yeah, we touched on some great stuff today, Paul. It's just, it's uh, really great to get inside your mind of how to put this together in the sense, I, I think in a world where we just look at, hey, give me three tips, you know, <laughs> give me the order well, in three distinctive, well, what, you know, so it's, it's really great to have these conversations. Well, I, I want to make sure that we have the, the, the big point for me, okay, the big point for me is that with organizational sport, or performance in general, you can look at military, professional baseball, youth development. Okay. Is, you know, what is the role of the strength coach anymore? What are they really looking for when you go get, get you try to get a job? Or even like when you, if you get funding for the person who was going to build your super gym, like wh what are they really looking for? You know, and how can we build systems? And maybe this is another conversation, part mm -hmm. two. Is how do you build a system for organization that incorporates these creative pathways that ultimately lead to robust athletes? And that's the real key for injury prevention, I believe, is building these anticipatory, downbeat, ready athletes, mm -hmm. you know, that, that can handle changes and variations. And that, but you have to teach that, you know. And, it, and before I was just like, oh, you got to do more versipole or, or, or K box or flywheel training to do that. But no, you, it, it's through the course of this conversation, really, I'm, I'm even understanding more. It's, it's the rhetoric and the entirety of the program from when you walk in, no matter what your tools are. You know, so those are great tools to build rhythmic uh, accepting of force. I think the, they're the best and it's great because you can have data or not with them. But the real issue is like, What's that first 15 minutes as a coach? Is it a throwaway foam roll sesh and uh, dynamic warm up that they've memorized that they're getting nothing out of? Or is it the best teaching point of the whole day? You know, no, I think it's the latter. Sell, though. <laughs> it's, the, it's the latter. It's the haka. It's the challenge. It's the mimicry. It's the response. Whatever side of it, of, of the line you're on. Yeah. You know? It's the, it's the beauty of it. It's the beauty of training is we're reproducing environments that you're going to see in, in game. You know, that's what, that's what it's about. Yeah, absolutely, man. Well, love it. Um, well, thank you again, Paul. Hey, it was awesome getting together, being able to do this podcast. So I appreciate it, man. Oh uh, yeah. I thank you so much. Appreciate you. Thanks for tuning in to another episode. I appreciate you. And if you enjoy the show, you can leave it a rating or review on Spotify, iTunes, whatever you are listening on. I would absolutely appreciate that. And I will see you next week. Have a good one.